1942. The American military is expanding rapidly and standing up new, special units for sensitive missions. The U.S. Army is experiencing a case of commando fever inspired by the daring-do of the British Army commandos. When faced with the need for an elite force to conduct raiding operations and develop an amphibious warfare doctrine, the Army's answer is the U.S. Army Rangers. The U.S. Army Ranger Battalion was modeled after the British Army Commando, being a lean formation that could be efficiently taken to shore in an LCA landing craft. Frills were kept to a minimum, with a Ranger Battalion being only 60% the size of a conventional infantry battalion. With a focus on amphibious commando operations, the Ranger Battalions consisted primarily of relatively independent, bare-bones companies intended for very short-term operations. Today we'll be taking a look at the Ranger Company organization on D-Day all the way down to the section level. If you want a deeper dive into the headquarters and headquarters company of the battalion with all the personnel and equipment, you can check out our article on the topic linked in the description. Each Ranger battalion consisted of a headquarters and headquarters company and six Ranger companies. At only 68 personnel overall, the Ranger company consisted of a very small company headquarters and two Ranger platoons. One company could be carried ashore in just two LCA landing craft, with one platoon per craft and the small company headquarters squeezing in. The company headquarters consisted of one officer and three enlisted men. The company commander was authorized as a captain, but could also be a first lieutenant, and was armed with a submachine gun and pistol. The company first sergeant, who was the company's senior most enlisted man, was armed the same. They also had a company clerk, ranking corporal, and a messenger, ranking private first class, both armed with M1 rifles. One company aid man would also be attached to each company from the battalion level. They would usually rank anywhere from private first class to technician third grade, which was equivalent in pay to a staff sergeant but without the command responsibility. There was no executive officer, as in U.S. Army doctrine, the XO typically commanded the rear echelon of the company, but in the Ranger company there was no rear echelon to be had. Meanwhile, each ranger platoon consisted of a platoon headquarters, two assault sections, and a special weapons section. The platoon overall was led by a lieutenant, assisted by a platoon sergeant with the rank of technical sergeant, the World War II equivalent of sergeant first class. Both were armed with submachine gun and a pistol. The platoon HQ also had a sniper and messenger, both ranking private first class. The sniper was equipped with an M1903A4 sniper rifle, while the messenger was armed with a rifle. The special weapons section was essentially a mortar squad with a tacked-on anti-tank capability. This practice was similar to the U.S. Army paratroopers, whose platoons had a 60mm mortar squad and a bazooka in the platoon HQ. This move was likely to reduce the overall number of personnel in the company by negating the need for a redundant weapons platoon. The section was led by a staff sergeant with a sergeant assistant section leader. It manned a 60mm mortar with a gunner, assisting gunner, and two ammo men all private first class. The assistant section leader, mortar gunner, and assistant gunner all carried pistols while the rest carried rifles. It should be noted that for some reason, pistols were heavily used in the Ranger Battalion TO&E in positions that would normally be warranted carbines in regular units. The reality is that while pistols were more common in the Rangers, M1 carbines would have been used as well as there's ample photographic evidence of Rangers using carbines on D-Day. It may have been SOP that the Rangers tasked with the initial ascent were more likely to be issued a carbine due to its lighter weight. In addition to the mortar, before July 1944, the section had either one bazooka or one boy's anti-tank rifle for local anti-tank defense. One would have been carried by the assistant section leader, while the other that wasn't being carried would have been kept in reserve. Now to the meat of the platoon, the basic close combat unit of the Ranger Company was the assault section. Although termed a section rather than a squad, the section was essentially a slightly modified rifle squad with a more well-defined command and control structure. The section headquarters contained the section leader, ranking staff sergeant, and armed with an M1 rifle. The assault section was further split into a rifle squad and light machine gun squad, which were essentially team-sized elements. The rifle squad was led by a sergeant, armed with a rifle, and further consisted of four private first-class riflemen. The light machine gun squad was led by a staff sergeant also armed with a rifle. 
It contained a gunner and assistant gunner armed with pistols, and two ammo men armed with rifles. In the official establishment, the gunner would have been armed with an M1919A4 belt-fed medium machine gun. However, for the initial assault on Point du Hoc, the M1919s would have been universally substituted with the M1918A2 BAR. The BAR benefited from being lighter with less fiddly ammunition and no need for a tripod, which would have been especially useful for the initial amphibious assaults and scaling the cliffs. Although we don't have a source that definitively states one way or the other, we believe that the assisting gunner would have most likely been rearmed with a rifle or carbine when the BAR was in use. Because the assistant wouldn't have to carry the machine gun and the gunner wouldn't be carrying a tripod, there wouldn't be a real need to only be armed with a pistol. However, there weren't any dedicated weapons platoons in the Ranger Battalion to make up for this loss in firepower. Following the initial assault, some BARs were replaced with the M1919 once again during the defense of Pointu Hawk. In addition to what was organic to the company, a reserve pool of equipment was available to each company from the battalion level depending on the mission. The Rangers took after the British commando system of maintaining a weapons reserve it could dish out to its companies when needed. On D-Day, it would have included 681mm mortars, 660mm mortars, 20 Thompson submachine guns, and 6 boys anti-tank rifles. For example, a ranger company could be issued mortars and provide the overall battalion with indirect fire support as was often done with follow-on companies. In addition to spare weapons, each company was supported by one jeep attached from the battalion supply and maintenance section. This jeep would have been used in garrison or if the entire battalion had landed for sustained operations, as the supply and maintenance section would have stayed in garrison for short raids. Further, two SCR-536 handy talkie radios would have been allocated per company. These could have either been operated by a member of the company or with a radio operator from the communications platoon attached in addition. Now going over how these companies landed on D-Day, the Ranger Group of the operation consisted of the 2nd and 5th Ranger Battalions, split into three task forces. Task Force A consisted of the 2nd Battalion's Headquarters Company, as well as its Dog, Easy, and Fox Companies. These elements launched in nine British Navy LCA landing craft and landed at Point du Hoc between Omaha and Utah beaches to silence a battery of 155mm artillery guns. Task Force B consisted of the 2nd Battalion's Charlie Company and would land in two LCAs at Charlie Sector on Omaha Beach. They would land on the right flank of Abel Company of the 116th Infantry Regiment who were landing at Dog Green Sector. They would then clear Point Irala de Percy and move overland to Point du Hoc in support of Task Force A. Charlie Company was among the first units to break through on Omaha Beach, despite the company that landed at Dog Green being destroyed. Lastly, Task Force C was an exploitation force kept in reserve to exploit a breakthrough at either Point du Hoc or Omaha Beach. It consisted of the 2nd Battalion's Abel and Baker companies, as well as the entire 5th Ranger Battalion. They were intended to be held back until 7am, after which they would be directed either to land in support of Task Force A at Point du Hoc or divert to Omaha Beach. Because of their mission, this task force was strengthened in comparison to the other task forces. The 5th's Charlie Company was outfitted with an additional 81mm mortar platoon, while its Fox Company formed an additional 60mm mortar platoon from the battalion reserve. Because Task Force A was late and Task Force C did not receive a signal in time, the latter landed on the right flank of Omaha Beach carried in 20 LCAs. The 5th's Abel Company reached the rally point at Chateau de Vimicil, south of Vireville, and proceeded overland to the 2nd Battalion at Point du Hoc. However, the rest of Task Force C was held up assisting the 116th Infantry Regiment in defending Vierville against potential counterattack. They wouldn't reach Point du Hoc until June 8th. So that does it for the Ranger Company on D-Day. As always, I want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. If you want to support us, get your name in video credits, a role on our Discord, and an exclusive wallpaper, consider becoming a patron. Link is in the description. Thank you everyone, and see you all in the next one.